overtime. All right, we're back out in the garage and I'm excited to continue working on this joust project. Now, I actually went ahead and did a couple of things. You know, I like to record everything and I did actually film this. So let me go ahead and show it to you as a bit of a, uh, a montage. So uh, yeah, ran into a little bit of trouble recording this stuff. Uh, so as you probably know, I've mentioned this before, I use my phone to record everything. It's just super convenient and I got, you know, good phone with good camera lenses on it. And uh, I actually just got a new phone. I upgraded to the latest iPhone, which should be great. Got all my apps moved over, that sort of thing. And uh, in my haste, went ahead and, and recorded actually like an hour or so, possibly more of, of footage. And I forgot to update the settings on my uh, camera app. And so uh, it, it was left with the default settings, which meant I was only recording in 1080p instead of 4K like I usually like to do. So, um, yeah, didn't really want to use that footage in its normal uh, normal format, so we're just throwing it in here, sort of as fast motion. And, uh, you know, it's not that big of a loss because you've seen me do all this stuff before, right? So I took the uh, the Wells Gardner K4900 monitor, took it outside, um, and washed it, sort of used the same technique that I always do, you know, garden hose on low pressure, some simple green, a soft bristle brush uh, to loosen up the, the gunk and debris, uh, rinse it off, rinse and repeat, uh, and then come in with my uh, air hose again on very low pressure and sort of blow all of the loose water off. Uh, and then uh, I was going to leave it in the sun, but it was actually kind of raining when I was doing this. So brought it straight into the garage, uh, put it under the uh, big fan that I have. Uh, it's been running for a few days. I actually just turned the fan off uh, to record this. Um, so that monitor is uh, nice and clean. You've seen me do this before. You've even seen me wash a, a 4900 before. Um, so that looks great. Uh, what else did I do? Continue working to strip uh, the old adhesive off of the control panel. Uh, I actually uh, uh, took the steel plate off of this joust control panel. So you've seen me do that here in this montage. Took that off. Uh, went through a couple uh, coats of uh, goof off and then scraping and then the goof off gel and scraping and you know, I'm making progress. It is just such, uh, it is so, so slow going and uh, I'm going to have to try uh, something else to kind of take it the, the last mile here. Uh, what else? I got a Williams transformer assembly. I bought this off of uh, eBay, I think. I uh, got a, a pretty good deal. It was advertised as a, a model for a Robotron or Joust. I believe they use the exact same setup. Um, the colors of the wiring, uh, coming off of the, uh, the transformer is a little different than what I was expecting, but I think everything is good. Um, and clean this up. So what I did this time, just totally disassembled it, washed everything separately by hand, uh, put it all back together as you're seeing in the video. And uh, yeah, I think we're in good shape. I did remove the original power cord. Uh, and Williams of this era used uh, just sort of this brown power cord that actually looks like something that belongs on a, a lamp, right? a household lamp. Uh, and it looked like it was in decent shape, but I didn't want to take any chances. So I removed it. I'll replace it with, uh, actually, I, I, there's a one at Home Depot that I, I pick up. I used it in a Robotron before. Looks exactly like the uh, the old school one, but it's not 40 years old and hasn't been run over and twisted and, and whatnot. So we'll reinstall, we'll, we'll reinstall, we'll install that new uh, power cord soon, but everything's looking good with this uh, transformer assembly and we'll be able to test it soon to make sure we're getting the voltages off of it. Some of the AC harness has been cut off of uh, the lugs uh, of, the, of the transformer. So once we get our new uh, complete harness, our reproduction harness, uh, we'll be able to hook that all up and, and start testing stuff. I could probably test things directly off the transformer now. Uh, I ordered that harness from um, Golden Age Arcade Parts. They build all of their reproduction harnesses to order, I believe, and it'll be shipping uh, from Western Canada. So. Might be a couple weeks before we get that, but that shouldn't be a problem. Um, yeah, and I think I think that's all I've done so far. Now, one thing I want to show you, um, today is actually my birthday, or at least when I'm recording this video, uh, this episode, uh, it's my birthday. It'll take me a couple of days to finish recording and then, you know, edit 
and upload and process and release the video, but today is my birthday. Uh, <laughs> getting old, right? Completed another trip around the sun. And, uh, you know, I can't say uh, getting old is fun, but, you know, my father always says the only thing worse than getting old is the alternative. Um, so in this box here is a little birthday present that I bought for myself. So if you've been following the series, you know that we discovered something a little bit interesting with the control panel. Uh, it looks like our Joust, we are very, very lucky that our Joust is one of the few that came with optical joysticks rather than the typical Joust joysticks, which are two-way leaf switch, you know, mechanical joysticks. Uh, a very small number of Joust cabinets came, came with William's very rare two-way optical joysticks. And I was trying to figure out, well, what am I going to do, right? Uh, do I temporarily put some leaf switch joysticks in there while I try to find some Joust optical joysticks? Uh, do I try buying some, like you can get uh, Arch Rivals joysticks and, and buy some conversion parts to basically try to recreate something equivalent to a two-way uh, optical joystick. Um, and I put a couple of uh, feelers out, including a, a, a wanted post on the claw forms looking for, you know, uh, a set of original Joust optical sticks in any condition, any restorable condition, thinking this is something that I'd have to bump on a monthly basis and maybe in a couple years I'd find them. And almost instantly, uh, I got no fewer than four fellow members of the Claw Forums reaching out to me, all with viable options, pointing me in different directions. You know, I was also saying, hey, maybe I'll grab some arch rival sticks in the meantime. And in this box right here is a set of original Joust optical joysticks. Uh, I was able to uh, buy these from uh, Brad Raydell, who is very well known in the arcade restoration community, especially uh, uh, for his work on Williams games. Um, Brad is awesome, thank you very much. Apparently it's, it's uh, so Brad actually makes um, a few different reproduction parts, some of which he sells on arcade shop and some he sells sort of on his own. There's a couple of other parts in here, uh, reproduction parts that he makes uh, that I needed that I ordered as well. Uh, uh, and I know Brad was, you know, he's gotten optical joystick uh, joust and I know he was holding on to a couple of spare sets and uh, I didn't think it would be uh, easy to convince them, so I don't know if it was my, my pleas and my begging or whatever, but um, Brad was so kind and so gracious as to sell me uh, this set, which have already been fully restored uh, by him. So I, am, I feel super, super fortunate, and thank you, thank you, thank you, Brad, and thank you everyone who's, who offered to help out. But I'm excited to pop this open and take a look at these joysticks. So we actually got Oh, and I don't even have it here. Do I? All right, I guess I'm gonna have to use my scissors to open up this box and it's very well packaged. All right. Here's another exciting unboxing video. You know, the last one I did for my Claw of Secret Santa unboxing, for whatever reason, did not do very well. Um, you know, unboxing videos are supposed to be super popular on YouTube, but maybe not with the demographics of my audience. So, all right, here we go. Like I said, very well packaged. Padding and packing peanuts. Let's start with the yellow Player One joystick. This thing is huge, tons bigger than the leaf switch joystick. Wow, look at that. Oh, <laughs> this is great. Yeah, and it only goes, it's got a restrictor in there, so it only goes, it only goes left and right. And I guess with these, the, uh, uh, the header pins, the connector is always to the right. So if you're facing this way, this is left, this is right. And yeah, it only, it's uh, restricted so that it only goes in that direction, nowhere else. Look at that. So I guess this is, you know, obviously the ball top, joystick shaft. We got, uh, so, yeah, twist the whole thing. This is sort of a bearing assembly right here. Initially, I thought this was some sort of grommet, but there's a, a bearing assembly in here. And let's take a look. There's a control panel or a, 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 a um, circuit board with uh, actually four different optical or opto switches, uh, uh, opto sensors. 
uh, including two that are unused. So I guess they, uh, Williams used the same board for four-way um, optical joysticks. There's a restrictor plate in here and a, uh, I guess you would call an interrupter. And basically the way this works is different than the mechanical joystick. So most, uh, most joysticks have switches, whether they're leaf switches or micro switches. Basically you move the joystick in a direction and it hits a switch, closes a switch. Optical joysticks have these, see right here uh, is a optical sensor. You can see a little bit easier in this one that's not actually used. And I guess it, it, it shines a light uh, between these two uh, posts. And if that's interrupted or blocked, it can tell that that light is, is being interrupted. And so there, there's this interrupter plate that moves back and forth and gets in between um, that opto and uh, basically breaks that connection. So that is awesome. And uh, yeah, and then at the bottom, this is called a spider, sort of just this rubber, rubber band kind of thing that helps recenter uh, the joystick. So that's awesome. So that's our yellow player one Joust optical joystick. And here is our blue player two joystick. Expertly and lovingly restored to pristine condition by Brad Raydell himself. And again, we have our left and right, back and forth. I can't go up and down. I can't go on a diagonal. I can really go just back and forth. Everything looks great. And uh, yeah, I guess the only difference uh, uh, harness wise between these and the um, typical leaf switch joysticks is these take, uh, I guess, an additional five volt uh, line, which is present uh, on the part of the main harness that is going to the control panel, but the, the Molex connector on the other side, that sort of has a, a blank uh, pin. Uh, and so we can just add, I think, a line and maybe uh, create a, a custom uh, connector here. Uh, I saw some pictures um, posted on Clav by, by RK David, uh, I believe, um, who's also got a optical joust and he sent me some pictures of what the uh, the optical harness uh, looks like, the optical control panel harness uh, looks like. So this is awesome. Brad, thank you so much. You are the man. Uh, I'll post links to your, um, it's not really a store. He kind of just sells it through email, but he's got a, a Google Photos page with, um, you know, photos of the products he sells. Very, very inexpensive. So this is a set of uh, door lock uh, latches. Um, which is sort of, these have been sort of ripped off of uh, my cabinet. And these are, you know, just sheet metal stamped and cut sort of the way you need it to be. So thank you, Brad, for that as well. Uh, these are uh, leaf switch uh, spacers because the Williams leaf switches that I still need for the uh, both flat buttons for player one and player two, as well as the one player and two player start buttons. Uh, the leaf switches need to be mounted a little bit farther off of the control panel as they would otherwise be. So uh, Brad tossed these in. Uh, this is a, uh, a brand new um, uh, volume pot uh, assembly. So there's a potentiometer here with a basically mini wiring harness. And this is a 3D printed bracket. So uh, this is what you use to adjust the volume inside of the cabinet. This has been ripped out. So this is a, a nice reproduction that Brad makes. And uh, I think that's everything. Just some packing peanuts and other packing material here. So Brad, thank you again. Uh, the um, Williams volume pot uh, assembly. I think these are also sold, uh, Brad manufactures them and, and they're sold through uh, Arcade Shop too. I think they were, might've been sold out at the time I was looking for these. So I got these directly from Brad. Leaf switch uh, spacers, door lock bracket uh, kit. And of course, extremely rare, extremely hard to find pair of original joust two-way optical joysticks fully restored and ready to be plugged in to my cabinet uh, once the control panel is uh, fully repaired and uh, I've got a harness <laughs> and uh, I modify the control panel harness uh, section to uh, work with the optical stick. So again, Brad, thank you so much. Um, uh, this was uh, like... I did not think it would be anywhere near as easy as it was uh, to find these things. Uh, I just chalk it up to the awesome community out there. 
of arcade collectors and restorers and yeah, just uh, you're all awesome people, especially you, Brad. So one other thing uh, I wanted to show that I got. So um, I always like to have original manuals for uh, all of my games, all of my cabinets, especially the ones that I restore. And I had previously bought a set of um, Joust uh, uh, manuals. I got, you know, very, very inexpensively off of eBay, a drawing set. I've got the uh, schematic sheet that originally would have been stapled on the inside of the upper uh, back door and some other sort of uh, parts or other uh, parts of the um, instruction uh, packet. Uh, the monitor manual, and they had a type A for the Wells Gardener and a type B, I think would have been a G07. They sort of have it on the same thing, just flip back and forth and yep. So um, this didn't have everything, which I knew. And then I found another set available. And I believe between the two of these, I'll have a full joust instruction manual set. So let's pull this out. All right, I guess the seller likes including some. This is from Playmeter, which was a, a magazine back in the day. Is Playmeter still around? I know there's Playmeter and Replay and one of them stopped publishing. Ooh, this is, so this is also the um, backdoor schematic sheet. And this one is in, other than the corners, like the staples obviously were just ripped out. This one is in nicer condition. Interesting, so now I've got two. So I don't know what I'm gonna do with the second one. Uh, if anybody needs it, let me know. So uh, the drawing, another copy of the drawing set. This one the cover's falling off, but that's fine. That's cool. So these are the uh, pricing stickers. So in the adjustments uh, uh, for the game, and actually I think they're uh, menu driven in the software of, uh, of Joust and other Williams games like Robotron, you can change sort of, you know, is a cost, you know, 25 cents per play or 50 cents per play. And when do you get an extra, uh, extra life? So this is an unused sheet of stickers, which is great. Um, some more uh, manual uh, instructions, another set of the manual instructions. Ooh, I guess, yeah, so maybe I'm still not uh, got a complete um, Joust manual set, but I'm getting closer and I like that uh, this um, uh, backdoor uh, schematic is uh, far more complete, so we're getting there. If uh, anybody sees anything that they need that uh, I now have two of, let me know. Be happy to send it to you. So uh, yeah, what should we do next? Well, now that we've got that uh, set of uh, Joust optical sticks, which I'm still just kind of blown away by that I actually found those, um, I really want to, as quickly as possible, put that uh, control panel back together. So before I do that, before we can you know, use dowels and, and Bondo and wood glue to fix the additional <laughs> bonus uh, buttonholes that were drilled into our panel, uh, I want to really get all of that adhesive, adhesive off. Uh, one of the things that's kind of uh, been an issue is, um, you know, I'm scraping and scraping and you can see some sections that are nice and flat. I was able to get a lot of the, the gunk off, but especially around these holes, uh, it gets harder, um, especially the, the holes that were, I guess even this one is a factory hole. Um, you know, there's like raised edges somewhat around where the holes were cut into the steel panel and it, and it stops the, the scraper from sliding. So I've got to figure out uh, what else I can do. I know some people will throw these into a fire, into a grill and just cook uh, everything off. One of the things I actually want to try is using a magic eraser because I can like almost just take my finger and kind of like go back and forth and rub uh, the adhesive off uh, by hand, you know, sort of it's broken down enough. So let me see if I can do that with a magic eraser. And similarly, you know, we got a bunch of parts of the uh, wooden control panel that still have adhesive on it. So uh, let me get set up for that and we'll, uh, we'll continue ripping into that and cleaning all that adhesive off. You know, I know this is a ton of work, but I, I wanna kinda like show everyone and document sort of how difficult it is to strip all that adhesive off. Uh, and then, um, you know, once, once everything's dry with a monitor, we can look at uh, recapping that, putting it back together and testing out the monitor. I know the monitor had been working at some point, at least I saw it working. Uh, and uh, we can also test, uh, we can install that new power cord onto the transformer assembly and test the voltages that we're getting off of the transformer uh, just to make sure we're in good shape there. So uh, let's get set up to do all that. All right, I experimented with a couple different things. 
the magic eraser really just wasn't getting it done. Um, you know, it was taking it off, but it was, you know, just as much work as the scraper and, and I just wasn't happy with the progress I was making there. So I finally busted out my random orbit sander and uh, that's actually been working really, really well. I don't know if you can see this patch right here on the, um, the metal, but, uh, and over here as well. I think this is where I spent most of my time with the sander. Uh, that's doing a great job taking everything off. I'm currently using uh, an 80 grit. Uh, I'll come back uh, when I'm done with a 220, kind of just, you know, uh, smooth out any rough spots. That's working great. It's working great on the steel plate. It's working great on the, uh, the wood part of the control panel. Uh, let me show you. Even, um, so we're taking off all the, and we're, we're working down here, taking off all the remaining uh, glue residue, adhesive residue, even working okay on the, the corners. I gotta be careful, especially with the 80, that I don't take off too much of the actual material. Uh, and kind of working on the uh, edge of the, uh, the sander, it kind of just pushes up all of the, the glue and then it comes right off. Um, so I'm going to keep working on this. Uh, like I said, I got to be careful, especially on the wood that I don't take off too much of the material and then I'll come back and smooth it all out with the 220. But, uh, let's get to work with this. So yeah, hopefully you can see the progress that we're making here. It's taken, taking that adhesive right off and leaving us with a nice clean surface uh, underneath. Uh, like I said, I will come back with the 220 uh, once I'm all done and kind of cleaning it up. The only thing I'm a little bit worried about is some of these newer holes have uh, some burrs, so I might have to take the file to them. Um, so I'm gonna continue working on this. Uh, I'll come back at the end and show you what that looks like and then we'll switch over to the wood part. Uh, I am gonna throw a mask on, I'm already wearing glasses. I'm gonna throw a mask on just because I don't really want to uh, inhale any of these particles, especially any metal ones. So uh, I'm gonna continue working on this and uh, I'll come back in just a moment. All right, that worked out great. So just like I said, uh, I went through with the 80 grit uh, disc on my random orbital sander, took off all the adhesive. There are a couple spots where I came in with the scraper just to help a little bit. But uh, yeah, that worked really great. You know, I was worried that, you know, using the sander, I've heard horror stories of it gumming up the sandpaper, but that really wasn't an issue at all. It only took me about, I would say, one and a half um, discs to get that all off. Uh, cleaned it up a bit on the other side, so this is the underside. Uh, cleaned that up a bit, um, came in with a file, like I said, and sort of cleaned up some of the uh, the new holes just to make it easier to get our, our dowel in when we repair it, uh, and then went over everything again with the uh, 220 grit uh, sandpaper. And I've got to say I'm very, very happy with how this came out. So this looks uh, infinitely better than it did with uh, just the Goo gone. I do think though that it was good that I first went over it with Goo Gone. That definitely took off a lot of it, but you know, to get the last stubborn bits off, it really did take the use of um, the sandpaper. So we'll consider the uh, the steel um, the steel sheet to be the steel plate to be done for now. So I've got a fresh uh, 80 grit disc on the sander. Uh, I'm going to start attacking the wood uh, the wood part of the control panel and we'll go from there. The only thing I want to be, again, concerned with is make sure that I don't take off too much material. I can feel this, this part that we did sort of sand already on the edge is a little bit lower than I, I want it to be. So I'm just going to go easy, especially on these corners and not take off uh, too much material. So let me put my mask back on and uh, I'll get to work. So I think that's working pretty good. Uh, I'm happy with the results. I'm gonna continue working on this. Like I said, being particularly careful 
on the uh, on the bends here on the corners and uh, after I get all the adhesive off I'll clean up sort of this part that goes under the steel plate uh, and then I'll uh, take a pass with the 220 and then I'll, I think we'll be ready to move on to the next step. All right, that came out great. Look how good this looks. Nice and smooth. We got all the old adhesive residue off. Uh, like I said, I went over everything with the 80 grit sandpaper that took off most of everything. A couple spots I had to come back to the uh, the scraper and, and scrape some, some gunk off, but uh, yeah, nice and smooth. Maybe I was a little bit aggressive in a few spots, but I can always come back with Bondo and kind of you know, fill that in, smooth that out. Uh, and then I went over it with the 220 just to make it nice and nice and buttery smooth. So I'm very happy with that. Uh, overall, I think we're in really, really good shape here. And I think we're ready to start moving ahead and uh, filling in these Swiss cheese holes with some wooden doweling with wood glue and some Bondo. So why don't we go and get set up for that? Okay, I think I've got everything I need to start putting this control panel back together. Uh, I already pried off some of these old joystick T-nuts just to bring them to Ace Hardware to find a match. I think we're good to go there, so let me just get the rest of these off. Um, these T-nuts mount, obviously, underneath the steel plate on the top of the control panel, and then the joysticks will screw into them from underneath. Trying to pull these out as gently as possible without damaging the wood. Come on. There we go. These are a bit rusty, but they're not so bad. And I guess when a previous owner converted this, you know, to that JAMA game. Um, they drilled through the T-nuts, so when I was looking at the control panel, these mounting holes from underneath, I couldn't see the threaded collar or whatever, neck of the uh, T-nut, so I didn't think they were still there, but obviously when we took the steel plate off, we found them, and they've just been drilled through um, so that the thread was gone to allow the joystick to be mounted um, all the way through instead of just, you know, underneath the steel plate. So there we go. Let's clean these out just a tiny bit. Any loose wood out of the way. Okay, so, uh, so that's good. So we've got our new T-nuts. Take a look at what these look like. And I think I got about as close as I could get, you know, obviously the the tooth pattern is different. Uh, the old ones had, you know, lots of, what is that? Six small teeth, and these only have three larger ones. Uh, but I think that's fine, you know, because the bolt will come in from below and it, it squeezes the Tina even more into the uh, control panel. So I'll kind of just start by hand fitting these, uh, and then we'll come back with a mallet, kind of knock it into place. See, that one doesn't want to go in as easily. I do think these are the correct size though. And like I said, the, the steel plate will kind of hold these down and then the bolt uh, coming in from below threaded into the T-nut will you know, really help keep these nice and secure. So I'm not particularly worried about that. You know, my main concern is making sure that the sort of diameter of the um, top or base of the, the uh, T-nut would fit into the recessed spot cut into the control panel and then that the, the uh, gauge of the T-nut was narrow enough, you know, wide enough so that it would keep things nice and secure, but narrow enough so that it would pass through the holes on uh, the mounting spots for the joystick. So let's move this over here give me a better surface to pound these in. And I know the lighting isn't as good over here because I don't have that overhead light. Let's see, can you still see that? Not really. So I'm just gonna kinda come in here with my mallet, kinda 
secure these into the into the control panel. I'd like them to be as flush as possible, though. That's not a huge concern because the steel plate will cover everything up. But I want the steel plate to be able to mount as uh, flush as possible. Ooh, that one's kind of... There we go. I think... I think we're in pretty good shape here. These all feel... pretty flush. Hmm. Feel a little crack in the control panel, but I don't think that's. Hmm. Well, I just want to go easy on this and not kill it. <laughs> that would be terrible if I crack this darn thing. Anyhow, I think we can fill that in with a little bit of. A little bit of wood glue or Bondo or something just to hold it in there. So, how does that look? We've got our T-nuts mounted in there. And so now I can come in with the steel plate and mount that on. All right. So let's see. Make sure we got no debris left on this. And uh, just like so. Is that the right way? Maybe not. Well, it's got to be. Let me make sure all the all the holes line up. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. All right. So that's good. Um, and I've got the original holes. Which one? I'll go back and look at the video later if I need to. I want to make sure we've got everything where it's supposed to be. A lot of these uh, old um, screws had glue left in the, what would you call this, a Phillips head sort of slot. And uh, that one didn't go there. Where did this larger one go? Oh, right here. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. We do that one last because I'll be able to flip it over without losing it. So let's just come in here with our screwdriver and start screwing these screws in to hold the steel plate on. And these don't need to be you know, crazy because, you know, everything, every little bit is going to help hold this in place. The control panel overlay, everything. What I don't want to do is strip the, strip the screws or strip the, the wood holes. So pretty secure is really all we're looking for. Just a couple more. Yeah, so there was some glue in these um, in these holes. So for some of them, I took the sander out, sanded that glue off just to make sure we weren't dealing with that. And remember, I did have one of these screws was totally, totally stripped and we had to, we had to remove it. So I got some more again from 
these hardware. I ended up getting 10 just in case I couldn't get the glue off, but I think we're good to go just using this, just one new one. All right, that's good. And now we can come back with this larger one that goes in here. And this, this one actually, I think held the rounding strap in place at some point, but come in here, we'll just hand tighten that for now. Uh, Cause we'll, we'll fix that later. We'll mount that grounding strap. So look at that. How does that look? Coming back together. So I think uh, what I want to do next is fill these, not these, these extra bonus holes. So let me uh, get my uh, doweling and uh, we'll get ready to do that. All right, I've got some inch and a quarter doweling that I need to cut down to size to plug these holes. Uh, I need four three quarters inch uh, length pieces to plug the bonus holes that we want to get rid of and then a few smaller three eighths of an inch plugs uh, to fill um, the holes that need to be counterboard. So I'll show you how all that works in a second, but I've got my table saw set up. I've got my fence right now at the three quarters inch length. I have to take the safety guard off uh, in order to cut that close. So we're gonna be extra careful. So yeah, let's cut four pieces of uh, three quarters inch long and then four pieces of three eighths of an inch. And before I do anything, I'm going to put gloves on. Holy moly. All right, I've got, I've got glasses on, but I've got gloves on too, so safety first. All right, there's my first plug, which of course goes flying across the room. I'm just going to uh, bring this over and dry fit it in one of these bonus holes just to make sure we're in good shape. Yep, that's good, good size, good depth. So let's cut three more of the three quarters inch. Collect those because they went across the room. One, two, three, there we go, or across the garage. All right, so now I've got four of those plugs, which is good. And now I'm gonna reset my fence at three eighths of an inch. So that was three quarters. That's a quarter. I'm gonna go just a hair short of three eighths, just in case I don't want the button to get uh, pushed out of the way. So this is real close. So, all right, here we go. We need four of these. see three of them and my fourth one I feel like it came backwards there it is right there all right so let's come over here oh don't drop them so unplug the saw come back over here all right so for the longer pieces we're going to use them to fully plug up uh, the holes right to there and the shorter pieces we will use as uh, to redo the counterboard holes that we want to keep. So 
Uh, those look pretty good. And uh, let me go and triple check to make sure which holes uh, we want to keep. So uh, I don't want to plug the wrong hole. So give me a second. Okay, I double checked and it's the buttonholes closest to the joystick holes are the ones that I want to keep. Uh, so good. Um, so that so for the player one flat button should be closer to the joystick hole than it is to the player one or one player start button. So that's good. So and I put some parchment paper down just in case the glue kind of seeps through. I don't want it to, you know, stick to my um, workbench top or glue the, the control panel to the workbench. So uh, what I'm going to do, most of these have a rougher side, if you can see that. They have a rougher side and a smoother side. So I'm going to make sure that the smoother side is facing up um, so that uh, we have an easier job sort of bondoing and sanding it before we put the control panel overlay down so it's nice and nice and flat, nothing poking through. So let me uh, let me start with these normal plugs. I'm just going to load up the plug with some wood glue, good healthy amount. All right, I'll smooth that around. Okay, kind of coat that whole that whole surface, and then I'm going to come in do the inside of the inside of the hole too, just a little bit. Glue really gets messy, but can be cleaned up. All right, got some paper towel over here to just clean that excess off. And I want the, I want this plug to be flush with the top as much as possible. And we will come back later, like I said, with um, Bondo and kind of smooth it out a little bit more, fill in the kind of, you know, tiny little gap but, uh, and then we'll sand it down just a little bit so it's nice and flat, but that's, that's pretty good. Let's see what that looks like on the back side or the inside. Poking out a little bit. Oh, and you know what I wanted to do with this one in particular? I had some wood poking up that I want to glue down. So we put a little dab on that. All right, that's looking pretty okay. I had to mess with it a bit, but uh, I think we're good to go there. So let me grab my next plug. We load this one up with glue. All right, kind of smooth it around with my finger. So we have a nice healthy, healthy coat. And I'll take the excess and work that on the inside of the hole. All right, that's looking good. And let's come through and work that in. Okay, not bad. Wipe off some of this excess glue right away. Get it as flush as I can. All right, we can fill that gap and smooth it out with the Bondo, but I think that looks pretty good. And I'm not too worried about the inside. The inside doesn't need to look beautiful, but uh, so that's good. And let's do the one of the uh, counterboard ones together. So again, these only need to go three eighths of an inch in, and then we'll, we'll drill the counterbore hole later. And it needs to be flush with the inside. So we want basically the back half of the, um, of the hole to be to be filled. So just dry fitting that. I'm gonna double check my depth of this piece. Yep, I think we're good. So let's put some, a little bit of glue on this. Smooth it around. Oh, 
think I've said before, I am not the most confident when it comes to the cabinet work and woodworking. I'd much rather be working on the electronics, but wipe off my finger and uh, let's come in, come in from the inside with this. Hopefully you can kind of see what I'm doing. Line that up. And we want this to be flush with the inside. So that looks that looks pretty good. Just make sure I don't have a ton of excess on the inside. And it's a little bit looser than I'd like it to be, but I think it'll dry in place and we can always bondo over it to get it perfect. So yeah, so that's what the counterboard holes that we want to keep are going to look like. So the ones we want to plug are filled all the way through and the ones we want to keep are plugged halfway through and then we will counterbore our other hole through that later. And uh, yeah, so let me go and do these other, uh, other holes. Uh, we'll let them dry and then we'll come back and do the Bondo work. Okie dokie, we are ready for Bondo. So again, what I want to do is skim coat the buttonholes that I've completely plugged. Uh, I want to fill in the other sort of extra holes that were drilled into the steel plate and control panel. And I want to fill these little extra bits, uh, uh, holes in the uh, steel plate above the uh, T-nuts that I've sort of covered up underneath with some aluminum foil. Um, I've got this old can of uh, Bondo that I've actually never opened before, this one. Um, so we'll get this popped open. And uh, this actually has the older red uh, hardening paste, the cream hardener. And I guess the newer ones, ooh, that's all nasty. Let me mix that up a little bit. I guess the newer ones, the newer, newer Bondo is all, uh, um, the cream hardener is blue now, which just seems wrong. So let me stir this up a little bit. All right, that's probably fine. Put a dollop on this board here. Uh, you know, you can just use um, uh, uh, paper plates or cardboard or whatever, which is what most people use, but I recently saw um, Retro Ralph use this kind of, you know, uh, uh, Bondo, almost like palette, like a painter's palette. And I figure, you know, hey, it's cheap. I can step up my Bondo game and become a real Bondo artist. So let's mix this up until it's nice and even. That beautiful salmon colored Bondo color. Does the, does the blue stuff look blue when you mix it up? That just doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem right to me. It's not your father's Bondo anymore. I wonder why they changed it. Is there some sort of chemical in this that's now bad for you? All right. This looks a little dry. Maybe this is just old, old Bondo. Hopefully it should work just as well. So I'm just coming in here and basically trying to skim coat this. We'll come back later with a sander and you know smooth it all out. But for now, I just want to get a coat of this stuff on. I want to make it so that this isn't kind of visible through the control panel overlay. And I think it'll give it a little bit extra um, stability and you know, strength. So 
I don't want to fill these, um, I don't want to cover up the screw holes just in case I ever do want to, you know, take this apart again. I can't imagine myself doing that, but just in case. So just skimming over this stuff. If it's not perfect. We can always come back and do it again. And try to push the material into these holes that I do want to fill. Okay. This looks terrible now, but we'll come back with a sander and get it all, get it all cleaned up. All right, let's see, push that into that hole again, without covering up the, the screw. And it's colder out here, so maybe that's affecting the, the Bondo a bit because it's already seems like it's getting pretty hard. I know some people might be going nuts because I am kind of Bondoing the um, the steel plate to the to the control panel, but I doubt I ever will take this apart again. Hopefully, unless there's something wrong, unless I screw something up on this project. So, and I want to fill in these gaps down here, so I'm not so worried about that. So those are skim coated. Let me see if I've still got time to do these before this batch of Bondo hardens. So I want to skim coat the inside of these uh, holes that need to be counterboard just to give it a little bit more stability. Let me do that with the little tiny putty knife here. I don't really care about the holes that I'm filling. Uh, they can look ugly on on the inside and those are nice and secure in there. I'm just a little bit worried about these counter bore hole sort of half plugs and you know because people might wail on these buttons and I want to make sure there's an, as much structural support as possible. I didn't drill these yet because you know the wood glue kind of dries and half an hour, but even the label says you really don't want to stress the joint for 24 hours. So we'll let all this dry glue and the Bondo, everything. And then we'll come back tomorrow. I mean, it'll still be this video, but tomorrow my time and we will drill those counter bore holes. And all jokes aside before about being a Bondo artist, I am uh, not particularly confident in my Bondoing skills. So if I'm doing anything wrong, please do not hesitate to let me know about it in the comments and uh, be sure to make suggestions about ways to do it better. I know I'm gonna have to come back and sand all this grossness off, so.
Okay, I think that's probably okay. And then there's just a few more spots, uh, random spots on the control panel that I'd like to just hit with a little bit of Bondo. I think this, this batch is dried out, so I'll make some more. Okay, I think, uh, I think that'll about do it. What a complete mess. Oh, nope, I didn't cover up. <laughs> I didn't cover up any of the things I wanted. I didn't want to. So uh, yeah, we've got uh, quite a bit of sanding that we're gonna have to do. I think I might actually let this dry overnight because it's getting late. I wanna go to bed. Um, I guess we could probably fill some of these other holes on the inside, but yeah, let me just do that real quick while I've got some extra bond already. If I do anything more, I'm gonna regret it. So let's let this dry and uh, then we'll come back and uh, sand the heck out of it. All right, it's the next morning. All of the Bondo and glue and everything is dry. Um, so we're gonna sand this all down, get it nice and smooth. You know, again, this doesn't have to look perfect because it'll be covered with the control panel overlay, uh, but we want it to be smooth to the touch so that we won't be able to fee uh, see or feel any bumps or imperfections or whatever through the control panel overlay. Uh, and I brought this outside into the driveway to do this sanding just because I don't want to fill my garage with Bondo dust. And uh, yeah, so uh, I'll throw my gloves on, we'll mask up. I've got uh, 80 grit to really knock down all the, uh, the roughness. I've got 220 to smooth it out. And I think I, got, I have some uh, 320 grit uh, discs uh, in the garage if I really need to get it smooth. So yeah, gloves on, mask on, and let's get to work. All right, that looks pretty good uh, with the 80 grit. I'm gonna come back with the 220 and just touch it up a little bit. And uh, then I'll go back and do all the rest of the, uh, the Bondo sanding. All right, I am uh, pretty happy with how this came out. Nice and smooth, I don't feel any raised edges really where the bondo is these holes are nice and covered on the edge too uh, and even on the inside i did a reasonable job with the uh the uh, countersunk or counterboard uh holes there's a couple spots where i couldn't quite get the sander into and you know out of sight out of mind it's not worth you know really getting in there with by hand and sanding that down because it's not going to interfere with mounting any of the buttons or joysticks or harness or anything so yeah uh i am quite happy uh with this <laughs> i keep running my hands over just because it's so nice and smooth so huge improvement over the swiss cheese we were dealing with before so let's get set up to counter bore uh these holes these button holes that i am keeping Hey guys, Charlie here. Apparently the audio was lost for about a minute in the raw footage. Basically, I just wanted to explain why we need these counterboard holes in the control panel. The William style leaf switch button has a wider part at the top and a narrow part at the bottom. The wide crown part sits on top of the countersunk area and the narrow shank passes through the counterboard hole. Now we skip ahead to where I've already drilled one counterboard buttonhole and now I need to do the rest. The wider opening at the top of the buttonhole is an inch and a quarter wide, and then the narrower counterboard hole at the bottom is five-eighths of an inch wide. 
RK David on the Claw forums recommended using a Forstner bit to drill cleaner holes. So that's what I'm using. I picked up a Milwaukee 5 8 inch Forstner drill bit from Ace Hardware and it's working great. So uh, thank you RK David for this recommendation. So yeah, just uh, drilling through and there we go, punching through the uh, punching through the wood, blowing out the sawdust and uh, yeah, just uh, making sure that the button sits properly in that counterboard buttonhole. All right, there we go. Four counterboard holes for the buttons. And I checked and the uh, reproduction button seats properly in the hole there. You know, so they're relatively centered enough. Uh, with this one, I noticed that it looks like the, the hole cut into the steel plate is a little bit bigger than it should be. So uh, I think that'll be fine though. Once it's mounted on the bottom, it's not really gonna go anywhere. See that little, little gap. I'm not too worried about that. Maybe we'll use some of the CPO material to kind of uh, help that stay in there. But uh, yeah, I think we're in good shape. Uh, I'm gonna go clean this thing up and then we'll be ready to apply the control panel overlay. All right, I think I'm ready to apply this control panel overlay. Huh. Uh, this can be kind of stressful, but um, you know, I think if we take it step by step, we should be fine. You know, I thought about um, painting or priming and painting or maybe clear coating the control panel because I know some folks have uh, success with that. I um, uh, uh, wasn't really sure I wanted to do that, so I reached out to a couple of folks with more experience uh, restoring uh, Williams games. Uh, Brad Rydell, who I got the joysticks from. Lonnie McDonald, the Joust Master, and also RK David on the claw forms. Uh, and they all said, you know, don't, don't prime it, don't paint it, don't do any of that, because it originally didn't come that way. Williams didn't do it. Just make sure it's very clean and uh, you should be fine. So uh, I cleaned it pretty well. I used my air hose and really knocked all kinds of dust loose, you know, sawdust, you know, from, from all the work I did. Uh, and then I wiped it down with a, a, a clean microfiber cloth that I damped, dampened with some distilled water. So I think we're good to go. Um, so uh, I've got a couple of tools here ready to go. I've got obviously our reproduction control panel overlay from uh, this old game. I've got a, a squeegee that I use for applying artwork. I've got some exacto uh, knives. I've got our reproduction uh, button set uh, uh, from Arcade Shop that we're gonna use to uh, hold the CPO in place while we're applying it and make sure we've got it aligned. I've got some sort of spring-loaded uh, rubber-tipped clamps uh, that we'll also use to hold the control panel in place. I've got my heat gun uh, to help a little bit making the bends. I don't know if we're going to need that, but I've got it just in case. And um, yeah, so uh, <sighs> um, I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, you know what the worst case scenario is um, we have to rip this off and do it over again. So, um, we'll be, we'll be out, you know, 40 something bucks plus shipping and, you know, some, uh, time to, um, uh, do the prep work. So this actually fits pretty good. Like, um, you know, it's not, not die cut in the sense that the, the holes aren't, uh, uh cut, you know, pre-cut in the, uh, control panel, which is great because, you know, uh, most people don't have the optical joysticks. Uh, like we have, um, so we wouldn't want the um, the leaf switch holes to be pre-cut. So we'll put there just for now, and let's see how it'll go wrapping around to the bottom. Okay, so we're not going to really have to trim this up, it doesn't look like. So uh, let me see where these buttonholes kind of line up. I'm going to turn off this light and take this terrible flashlight that I have and... Uh, I can't even get in there. Um, let me figure out what I'm going to do flashlight wise here real quick. Okay, I actually grabbed my uh, headlamp uh, flashlight just because it's very low profile and uh, uh, pretty bright. So I'm going to come in here and hopefully you can see this on camera. I can come in from below and kind of see the overall um, posi position of the hole, right? So that I can sort of cut through poke through and mount the holes. Um, and I think we're pretty well aligned. You know, I've got the, um, the CPO dead on center on the control panel uh, itself. 
So if anything, I think the, the CPO, the reproduction CPO might be just a millimeter short on either side, millimeter shorter than the actual control panel, which is no big deal at all. Um, but I wanna move it to the, the left ever so slightly, because as much as possible, I want the, the flat buttons to sort of fall right between both sets of, of wings. So I'm gonna favor the left side just a bit. Um, and I don't want to do it to the point where I've got like an overhang on the left side or anything like that. So uh, it might be, you know, imperceptible, but we're just gonna come over a hair to the left, get my OCD in full effect. And we can always come with a Sharpie on the right side and, um, you know, color that in just so we don't have any kind of wood or, or anything like that poking through. So we'll put these clamps back on. It looks pretty aligned. And then we'll see. All right, I'm pretty happy with that there. It's still a little bit maybe left, but that could just be the, the holes not really perfect. Um, I think that's what we're going to do though. I don't want to mess with this forever. You know, it wasn't perfect coming from the factory. It doesn't need to be perfect here. You just need to be good enough for my basement. So I'm just picking it up now and making sure that when I bend it down, yeah, we're going to have to make that turn pretty sharp to hit the bottom, but I think we're pretty straight. So I think what we're going to do now is uh, use our X-Acto blades to poke holes where the buttons need to go and the buttons will help to hold the, uh, the CPO in place while we apply it. So get this X-Acto blade out. Being extremely careful with this. And I'm just gonna kind of find the center and poke a hole. I don't wanna cut beyond the circumference of the hole. And you know, some people will cut in a circle and completely remove the material. But because these you know, holes have been worked a little bit, I kind of just want to, uh, sorry if I'm in the way, I kind of just want to, uh, where's the light? I kind of just want to leave that material to sort of add a little bit of width to the, uh, to the hole, if you understand what I mean, kind of uh, leaving that excess material, sort of poking it through. Let's see if that'll, why is that not going in? What is going on? Oh, oh, oh. Understand what I mean when I say it's stressful? That's uh, because of the top part. These uh, perforations aren't going far enough. They've got to kind of go to the wall of the hole. You know, we don't want to bind up the material when we clamp it down with the pal nuts. Let's see if that's going. All right. That looks pretty good. Take a pal nut. We'll screw that on. Just hand tight. Come over here. 
kind of making sure that we're not knocking it off of where we kind of want it. Okay. Oh, man. So we come in with this other hole. Oh, that's the, <laughs> that's the joystick hole. I'm not too, not worried about that just yet. So we'll take this. the edge. And this is the hole that I'm a little concerned is um, wider in the, like the, um, the hole cut into the steel plate is a little wider than it kind of should be. So hopefully this extra material will cover up that gap and add a little thickness to hold everything in place. So let's come in with our player one button. Push that in. Let's see how it's, oh. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna be able to see some stuff, but oh well. Yeah, you can kind of see it cut through. I kind of cut too far. I don't think there's anything we can do about that, but it is what it is. You know, I'm not trying to make museum pieces, these things. Uh, when you, you know, back in the day, you find them on location, they were never, never perfect. Even coming out of the factory, they were never perfect. So I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. Oh, man. I wonder if there's anything we can do, like packing the hole underneath. Yeah, I just don't think there's anything we can kind of do there. Oh, it's a little disappointing, but those imperfections are what make, will make it my own. When you're playing, you'll never notice it because you're never looking at the control panel. And if it ever really bothers me, well, heck. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can always redo it. Yeah, looking from down here, sort of, that gap is obvious, but from above, it's not so much. And I think we're relatively centered on the player two side. Um, actually, we're kind of binding up a little bit. Um, I mean, that's not going to be an issue once we actually put the CPO down. But So we're relatively centered on the, if I can get the palinet to start biting, there we go relatively centered on the player two side. I think we're off a little bit to left on the player one side, and obviously we've got this gap down below, but I'm not gonna lose sleep over that. So yeah, let me cut these other two uh, holes for player one and two start, uh, or one player and two player start, and then I'll be right back. All right, I've got the other buttons on. Um, again, I'm still a little bit disappointed with this, but that's nobody's fault, not even really my fault. It's maybe I could have done something to fill that gap, but uh, we'll leave that for now. Um, these two buttons up here aren't quite perfectly even. The player, the one player start is off to the left a little bit and, so that it kind of cuts into this platform. Number two is far away off from that, but I think that's how it's supposed to be because I can see there's a bigger gap here than there is here. Um, and the player one button looks a little bit higher than the player two button, but I think again, that's just how the, the control panel was cut, right? So. Can't expect perfection. I don't know if they necessarily had a real jig or something they were using at Williams to cut this or if they were kind of just getting it close, right? Um, so, oh, let me grab my scissors. And uh, what I kind of want to do is, as much as possible, make this sort of first bend, cut below that uh, uh, into the, the material, the, um, the, the, the backing, of the, uh, the, the CPO. Then I'll fold it down. Uh, I'll roll it sort of like this. Actually, I can do that right now. Um, so I'm gonna pull it down here, pull this as tight as I can, get this part flat. We'll smooth this out with the squeegee and then I'll make the second bend. Uh, and I can use my um, heat gun to sort of help us um, you know, soften the material a little so it'll make that bend and then we'll clamp that. 
And then we'll take uh, the clamps off, we'll take the buttons off, we'll peel back the rest of the backing, and then we'll lay it down on the top part. So, oh, so I wanna cut it about maybe here. So here goes, I am, I'm gonna peel back, peel off the backing. Oh man, come on. Catch it with my fingernail. There we go. Oh, I don't know what I'm so stressed out about. This is, it's not super expensive. It's cheaper than side art. I forget what this was, 40 bucks maybe? 40 something bucks. So right about there is where I wanna cut it. So come in here with my scissors. Okay, <sighs> all right, and I wanna pull this down hard and get this as tight as I can without getting my fingers in there. <laughs> I almost wish I had a clamp sort of holding this, holding the control panel down there we go, maybe if I do it like that. All right, it's biting. We have adhesive onto the control panel. And now I can come with my squeegee that came with my um, Zacto blades. It's sort of a artwork application kit. So we're coming in here and pushing hard just to make sure we have no no air bubbles. I'm not seeing any yet, which is good. It's nice because it's got this felt on the squeegee, so I don't have to really worry about pressing too hard and, and messing up the artwork. So let me turn on my, let's bring this to the edge. Let's turn on my uh, heat gun and help help this make this bend. Let's see if you can see that. Uh, probably. So I'm just going to use this to help soften it to to make this bend over to the bottom. Start, I guess, with the middle maybe. Let's get it warmed up. See if I can do it with the don't want to melt it. It's the only thing I'm afraid of. Put that down for a second. I think I think we're good with that. So let's try to make this bend. Okay, I think we're in good shape. Oh man. Oh. So how's that looking? Not so bad. I'm not seeing any real air bubbles. And I am using the dry method for CPOs. Um, I typically use the wet method with rapid tack for uh, side art. And I know some people, yeah, maybe it's, maybe you can use the wet method for metal control panels, applying control panel overlays, but not, not with this. I wasn't sure how the wood would absorb stuff or how maybe uh, how maybe um, 
um, anything, you know, whether it's wrap attack or whatever would react with the Bondo. So I'm just taking all this off. I'm going to work relatively quickly. I'm just removing the buttons. All right. Okay. There we go. Make sure we're still in frame and we're not. Sorry about that. It's a daily reminder of the low budget production we have here. One man crew, although my 10 year old was asking me today, he wants, whoops, he wants to help work on this stuff. He's done a little bit before, but I guess he wants to do more. He uh, was very excited to see that I had reached 500 subscribers. So thank you all for that. I really appreciate the support and I will aspire to live up to your expectations of me, but know that you're making my 10 year old son proud of me. So let's roll it this way. And again, starting from the middle. Kind of, let's get some more heat in here. We'll flip it around. Low heat. Yeah, you're making my 10 year old son proud of me. I mean, he's proud of me for other reasons and not making a big deal out of it, but yeah, they, uh, him and his siblings live on YouTube. So the fact that their daddy has a channel with 500 subscribers, Seems pretty cool to them. So here goes. Make this final bend. All right, this is going pretty good, I think. Famous last words. all out. All right. It's looking pretty good. You know, with the light at this angle, I can kind of see, I don't know, where the metal ends, where some of the bond repairs are, but, you know, in a, in a dark arcade, Never gonna see it. Okay, how's that? Let's see. How does that look? I'm sort of looking at different angles, making sure I can't see any. Uh, air bubbles and I don't. So I'm happy with that. Let's get, uh, let's get these buttons back in. So player one flap, screw it on. And I think I'm going to bring this into the house overnight just so the, the glue is in a climate controlled environment. On. Um, it'll be in the back to normal temperatures tonight, so um, actually let me cut this a little bit. There we go. 
So I just don't want it. I don't want that adhesive freezing maybe as it's really trying to bond to the control panel. All right. Player two, or two player start. And these are translucent red buttons. So uh, they're meant to be backlit. So there was a, um, uh, a bayonet lug for like a coin door light on the original harness. Probably replace those with LED just to make them um, more bright. I've got a similar setup on my Robotron. So let's take a look at that. How does that look? I think that looks pretty darn good. A million times better from what we had before, if you remember what that looked like with that Street Smart overlay. And yeah, you can kind of see, I can see where the steel plate ends and the wood begins. Um, I'm not gonna lose sleep over that. Um, okay, and the last thing I wanna do here is uh, cut out the holes for the um, optical joysticks and mount those in there, and then we'll really be able to see what this looks like. So I can kind of just see it. Um, can I see it better? No. Uh, let me turn this light on just to give me a little bit more. Can you see that over here? Is that showing up on camera? Yeah, so you can see this um, outline. So I'm gonna come in here with our X-Acto blade. Kind of take this to the edge. Hopefully my head's not in the way but I wanna see what I'm doing here. We're coming in, we're cutting just to the inside of the hole. Using the, using the steel plate as our template. So, well, it could've been a little bit cleaner, but we'll be okay. Clean this up a tiny bit. All right, that looks pretty good. Okay, and let's move our flashlight to this side. And do the same deal over here. Poke a hole, take it to the edge. And sometimes when you buy reproduction overlays, they might be die cut, which means there's already a, a hole for the joysticks and the buttons, but those have their own sets of challenges with uh, lining everything up, especially if there are some you know, natural tolerance, tolerances or now the lights are in my eyes, uh, imperfections. So by not having it die cut, you have an opportunity to tailor it to your own unique situation and needs. Okay. All right, I think that looks pretty good. Let me cap this exacto knife before I injure myself. It's over here. Where's that other, here it is. Here we go, we'll make some, add some stickers. Here we go, a couple stickers. I just added to my workbench there, right up there. All right, so let's get the, whew, let's get the uh, optical joysticks mounted here. So um, I had to buy new, uh, T-nuts, obviously, uh, so that we can mount the joysticks into the control panel. Uh, I want to clean that up a little bit. And uh, I got matching uh, bolts of two different lengths. There we go. Matching bolts of two different lengths so we can rock and roll. Um, uh, let's see. All these pennies that I spent at Ace Hardware getting this stuff. Uh, 
So I got two different sizes that we can try working with. These are going to run everywhere, of course. And I've got washers to go with them. I think the longer ones are one I'm going to want. So let's put these here so we don't lose them. And I got regular, regular washers and uh, lock washers. So I think this is what's going to do it. Okay, let's, uh, where did I put them? Oh, they're over here. Let's grab these optical joysticks. Again, I, I'm so, so thankful to Brad Raydell for um, selling me these, uh, these joysticks. Um, they are extremely rare. He's one of the, yeah, and um, I just, I, I can't thank you enough, Brad. So I want to get these bolts in here. For each one, we'll take a, a washer and a lock washer. And let me grab a screwdriver, small one, it's working in tight quarters here. Line this up and make sure it's not, not too long. Nope, that's perfect. Okay, another one. Lock washer, regular washer. All right, put that in there. Not too hard. Because again, we'll be taking this out a couple of times before it's, you know, finally and permanently mounted in the cabinet. All right. So these bolts are going into the T-nuts, the new T-nuts that I installed underneath the control panel overlay. And one more on this side. And all I'm doing is got this bolt you can see that put a whoops put a little lock washer on it and then a regular washer on that and this is what's going through and mounting into the underside of the control panel and like I've seen from all of the footage uh, this sort of connector these header pins are always to the right so I think this is the correct orientation. Whoops, bump the camera. All right, go left and right. We cannot go up and down. We can only go left and right. And uh, yeah, so let me, um, let me install the other one and I'll come right back and we'll wrap up the video. All right, look at that thing. <laughs> look at this thing. Look how good that looks. My goodness, I still can't believe that I was able to find these original optical two-way joysticks. <sighs> We've got the reproduction buttons from Arcade Shop, which will be great. Um, the reproduction control panel overlay from this old game. I'm gonna leave some clamps on this uh, overnight just to really help the adhesive set in. And yeah, that looks so good. <laughs> that looks so good. My gosh. The joysticks feel amazing. Absolutely amazing. Buttons feel good. Looks great. I am very happy with this. So obviously we've got some work to do still rewiring the, uh, or wire up the, the harness once we get it in. Um, and, uh, yeah, we should be uh, good to go. I'll probably have to modify the harness a little bit to work with the uh, optical uh, joysticks. They used, I think, a slightly different connector, and I think they also took five volts. So we'll get all that figured out in a future episode. Um, but uh, I am very, very, very happy with how this control panel turned out. So 
<sighs> uh, we still got a long way to go with this uh, with this joust restoration. We got a lot of cabinet work to do. Uh, I guess well, not really so much cabinet work. We got a ton of electrical work to do. So I think maybe in the the next episode we'll start working on the uh, the transformer. Maybe touch that up a little bit. Make sure it's working properly. We'll recap the monitor. Make sure the monitor is in good shape, uh, and then we will be well on our way. So. Uh, <laughs> as always, thank you for watching. Um, again, I appreciate all of the, the great, you know, feedback and engagement everyone's provided. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please, you know, please subscribe. You'll make my kids happy. You'll make me happy. Uh, I appreciate all the likes, the comments. I try to respond to every single comment that I get. You know, please feel free to share my videos with uh, other folks you think might be interested in this stuff. And uh, yeah, just again, thank you for everything you all do. It really makes, uh, makes this all worthwhile. So, <sighs> all right. Uh, as always, uh, this has been Overtime Arcade. I'm Charlie. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Oh, 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 overtime! overtime!